Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Jean Baudrillard's critique of Marxism, what we can really find most prominently in his text, The Mirror of Production, but we find it all throughout his work, from Symbolic Exchange and Death to the uh, sh In the Shadow of the Silent Majorities and a number of other texts in which he lays out his critique of Marx and Marxism. Now before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you're new here, welcome, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. If, uh, you know, if you want to go check out my channel, there's more than 200 videos there, I think at this point. Uh, if you want to help me out, do all those things, like, share, subscribe. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts where there shouldn't be any ads. Or if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find the video on YouTube if you're into that at all. So yeah, let's jump into this here. Now the main text for this critique, that is Baudrillard's critique of Marxism, is The Mirror of Production, in which he lays out some of the limitations of Marx's thought, specifically some of the assumptions that Marx makes about humans what he makes about animals, what he makes about production, what he makes about value. And he really, that is Baudrillard here, really digs in to these assumptions and questions them and their, their real validity when it comes to assessing human interaction, human exchange, that is the exchange that happens between humans, not the exchange of humans, of course, the exchange that happens between humans and other things as well. Now we get resonance of the resonances of this criticism, like I said earlier, all throughout his work. So symbolic exchange and death is going to bring up these themes quite a bit. Uh, once again, seduction is going to bring up these themes, fatal strategies, uh, in the shadow of the silent majorities, and so on. So it's a recurring theme throughout all of these texts. Now, with that being said, Baudrillard is obviously indebted to Marx's work, his earlier stuff, that is before the mirror of production. So here I'm talking about the system of objects, the consumer society, and for a critique of the political economy of the sign, Baudrillard is using much of that Marxist rhetoric in order to understand contemporary society. Now, with that being said, he doesn't completely do away with all, with all of those ideas when he releases the Mirror of Production in the early 70s. In fact, in my opinion, he's trying to find a way to rethink these categories to expand Marx to such an extent as to better understand what is going on today, all the while pointing to the limitations of, of strict Marxist analysis. Now, I think that this is clear in the fact that Baudrillard very clearly read Marx and has a very firm grasp of Marx's texts, from the manuscripts all the way up through Capital and the Gundrissa and the Poverty of Philosophy as well. All of these Marxist texts uh, Baudrillard is very familiar with, including many Marxists that would come after, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Althusser, and so on. He's very much committed to understanding this field. Now, the first real issue he brings up is that the idea of production is something that remains uncritically within Marx's framework. That is, pre and post capitalism, if we can imagine such a thing, production will, in a sense, continue. Now, in Marx's vision, I think that this should be nuanced a little bit because although Baudrillard is a very good reader of Marx, in my opinion, there are some elements that should be nuanced in how Baudrillard approaches it. Now, for Marx, the transformation of society from capitalism to communism is one that'll happen somewhat organically. So there isn't really a moment in Marx when it says, you know, class consciousness will uh, enter a certain phase and people will just um, catalyze the revolution. You don't really have that. In fact, there needs to be an organic movement into communism. Now, some basic uh, necessities have to be met for that to happen. And these have to be met in capitalism. There's a very famous letter that uh, Engels had written to another political economist of the time, or uh, another socialist at the time, where Engels wrote that it would be totally wrong to read in his and Marx's work the idea that history should move backwards, that Europe at that time in the late 19th century or mid to late 19th century should move backwards, should try to you know, go back to agrarian type, living off the land lifestyle. Marx and Engels believed in that. In fact, they very much needed or understood that capitalism was going to provide the conditions to undo capitalism. And that was because it was going to encourage production. It was going to encourage an understanding that production and value 
originate in real human labor, not from God, not from uh, any kind of mystical or spiritual plane. It comes from real human labor. Not to mention the fact as well that capitalism is going to be able to usher in new forms of communicative technology that is going to allow uh, people to communicate uh, in order to organize rallies, organize resistance to um, capitalist takeover. Additionally, it, capitalism was going to foster uh, scientific developments and scientific improvements, a move towards, or that would set the stage for what uh, Rosen Luxemburg calls and Louis Althusser calls scientific socialism. All of these components were going to be necessary and they were going to come about through capitalism. Now, only when these conditions were met would communism even be possible. Now, as kind of an, an aside, this certainly would explain, at least in part, why, you know, the Maoist movement, why Stalinist movement were not communist uh, regimes in the strict Marxist sense, because there was a great deal of poverty, there was a great deal of illiteracy in those places at the time that made it so that, you know, it, it was trying to catalyze a movement that didn't have the time to actually fully unfold as per Marx's imagination, uh, at least in my reading. Now, the problem with this for Baudrillard is that it keeps intact the idea or some of these ideas about progress, about science, about um, human needs, about production, even after capitalism. So Baudrillard's alarm bells go off and say, well, how critical is this project really? That is, if it's keeping all of these tenets intact, that is, if it is keeping these certain logics that have a a suspicious connection to Western modernity and enlightenment, how radical is it really? So if it's going to rely heavily upon science, this idea of scientific socialism, what is going to happen at the end of it? Or another way I like to think about this, what happens with education? Is the type of education that is going to be taught post the worker revolution, is it going to be indigenous education, teaching indigenous knowledges, or is this going to be a kind of education that is going to teach only what a specific state, what a specific body of workers is going to deem to be appropriate? How do we actually ward out or understand the differences between uh, pure scientific socialism that is committed to a, an entirely materialistic view of the world? How do we reconcile that with spiritualism? How do we reconcile that with knowledges that do not necessarily subscribe to these tenets? Now, with that being said, as an aside, that doesn't mean that Marx is not still valuable. I think that a lot of these considerations can be implemented into Marx's thought, personally. But this is the beginning of Baudrillard's criticism, that is, questioning these tenets that will remain alive and that will intensify moving past capitalism. Now, additionally, in Marx's work, there is obviously a tension between use value and exchange value, where exchange value is going to refer to a thing's value in terms of the market. How much money is it going to buy? What can you trade it for? And so on. Whereas a use value is going to comply to a specific demand that someone has for that thing. Now, I think that Baudrillard gets this a little bit wrong in Marx, because Marx is very clear in the first volume of Capital that use value can be anything. A use value in terms of commodity exchange just could be anything that anyone needs. It's not uh, referring to sustenance. It's not referring to sustainability. It's not referring to like shelter or things that uh, we might think that people need as basic universal human needs. But in any case, Baudrillard interprets it that way. Now, with that being said, I think that there's still what Baudrillard's critique about this is still valid. And that is that what are basic human needs? Are the needs of everyone going to be the exact same in this next world? How do we actually account for things like disability? How do we actually account for things like one's mental health, for example, where different people are going to act differently, going to have different responses to different societal arrangements that are going to demand different ways to deal with that. So Baudrillard goes after Marxism for that as well. But in my opinion, I think that Marx and Marxism, especially many of the Marxists that would come after, really would account for that. They would consider the ways that the state, if it actually organized production effectively, it would be able to generate a, a kind of nest egg that would be able to account for these, perhaps, uh, these needs that people might have that are going to be specific to them, that, you know, the state could then 
take care of, be able to manage. But this still demands a great deal of production. It still demands a great deal of work. So work remains as a category that is still going to be intact. However, this work in the communist imaginary is going to be one that is not conducted to earn someone else surplus value. So work is going to be done and what you are going to be paid, what you're going to be compensated for your work is going to reflect the actual work you put in. So in uh, a capitalist economy, that is not the case. In a capitalist economy, workers go to the market ostensibly as free agents. They arrive at the market and say, I am prepared to work. And the capitalist says, okay, I can't actually pay you what you think your work is worth, because if that was the case, I'm not gonna be able to make a profit off of anything that I am gonna sell. Because if I paid you what you wanted to be paid, I'm not gonna make anything. So I need to undervalue what you are coming to the market with as a laborer in order for me to make a profit. Now this is a problem and obviously this is, uns this is, this is unsustainable. However, it serves as the backbone of the capitalist economy. For Baudrillard, what would follow, what would follow capitalism is just gonna be a reorganization of that labor to such an extent where labor becomes more productive, more efficient, where it is done for the betterment of the majority, not for the minority of capitalists who are going to extract surplus value from the majority. So in that case, production still remains intact and it still remains the driving force of any kind of economic system and the political categories at large. Now Baudrillard wants to leave room here to think about alternatives to that. What does that imply that work is going to continue? Why must this kind of work continue? What alternatives might there be and how are these alternatives foreclosed in this complete capitulation to or submission to Marx's understanding of the transformation of capitalism into communism, this commitment to even more effective work, to more productive work. Now, while, of course, Baudrillard isn't saying, yes, what we are currently sitting in is the, is the best system we can probably have. He's not saying that. Don't get that wrong. But he's pointing to many of the issues that are inherent to Marxist criticism. Now these do get, I think, a little bit resolved or do get uh, accounted for in some of the later Marxists, David Harvey, for example, Postone, thinking about these categories in somewhat different ways or thinking about them in the late 20th and, and into the 21st century that account for many of these issues. But in any case, value and how Marx traces it back to labor. And Marx wasn't the first to say that all value really originates from human labor. Adam Smith, Ricardo before him were saying this as well, but Marx keeps this idea very much alive. This idea that human labor is what gives birth to value. Now this presents another issue for Baudrillard because he wants to think about spirituality. He wants to think about um, various zones, various cultural artifacts that don't necessarily subscribe to this logic. So for example, a sacred rock or or something in nature that has not had any real labor applied to it, yet has a great deal of value in a specific setting. Now, to Marx, that would just be an example of a kind of naive, childish, pre-industrial uh, mode of living that has just, you know, hasn't fully embraced materialism yet, hasn't fully shed the illusions of superstition, of religion, of everything like that. But we can still see resonances of these kinds of logic to this day. And it, I think that it reveals one of the great mysteries of value, where value seems to sprout out from nothing. And Marx wasn't a stranger to this. Marx was very much concerned with this increase of value, where value just seems to come out through what he calls, at least in the English translation, a kind of hocus pocus. It just seems to come out of nowhere. But it reveals the extent to which humans are not necessarily just geared to understanding value in terms of human labor. And the fact that value can come from other places as well, where things can certainly establish the entire or condition an entire social arrangement that is completely outside of the domain of labor, of real human labor, like a sacred rock or a sacred tree or, or whatever, that is going to comply to a completely other logic. And it seems, at least in Baudrillard's thought, to be totally reductive to say that, hey, uh, these people are just childish or they're just naive, superstitious, not actually understanding the, uh, the real human value associated with real human labor. So coming into the 21st century, we're also presented with a few other issues that I think Baudrillard best uh, anticipated. 
So one of the ways I like to think about this is like my own self. Am I a laborer when I put up these uh, videos for everyone or this, this podcast for anyone listening to it in that platform? To some extent, I am. I'm putting in labor. YouTube is my employer. They are extracting something from me uh, more than what my value actually is. So when I put up this video, I earn my revenue through ads. Now, ad revenue might be $10 for a video, let's say, hypothetically. I'm not actually gonna make $10 because YouTube's gonna make a cut of that and they're gonna take more than it actually costs them to uh, hold the servers in order to actually host this video. So they're gonna make a profit from my labor that I'm never gonna see, even though it is me doing this labor. And like I said, they're taking that profit above their initial cost in actually hosting the servers and so on. But me as a laborer, what relationship do I have to someone, let's say a mine worker or someone working in a factory? Has anything changed in terms of these types of relations? Because it seems as though they have, and especially when we consider the advent of certain digital technologies that foster people's entrance into uh, working relationships where there is this you know, semblance of autonomy, where they are uh, further atomized from developing any kind of recognition with one another. I will be very happy the day that uh, YouTube content creators form a union. This might get this video completely demonetized. Uh, but I think that some of these questions are important to ask and how these digital technologies, someone, something that uh, Baudet is quite uh, famous for analyzing, how this alters the terrain of capitalist exploitation. Now, you can't forget that a lot of this production, a lot of what we are seeing occur, like on YouTube, uh, where let's say I'm a worker, is contingent upon real, immediate, undeniable exploitation occurring overseas, in India, Bangladesh, the Philippines, where people are paid very little to produce uh, the hardware to produce, in some cases, even the software that is going to go into allowing YouTube to run its algorithm in these ways to make sure that certain content doesn't appear on their platform and so on. And so these relationships in the strict kind of classic Marxist sense are still very much alive, but, you know, they've been overseas, overseas. They've been offshore to different places where it's harder to recognize, but that's sort of a tangent. I'd be curious to see what anyone else has to say about that. Now, Baudrillard says something else that's kind of, I don't know if this is historically valid, but he says that at the time that Marx was writing, workers were already striking, workers were already uh, destroying the mach their machinery in order to revolt against their exploitation. But Marx paid very little attention to that. In fact, Marx was uh, almost lamented these movements because they weren't the right kind of revolt. And I think that Baudrillard is really right in this criticism, assuming it is historically valid, because these types of revolts wouldn't actually be effective in motivating change because they are just individual instances. They aren't actually going to increase the logic of productivity to the point that it's going to just naturally evolve into communism. They are actually hindering the movement of capitalism to develop into communism. And so this is why Baudrillard says that Marxism is really only the mirror of production it only keeps the same categories of capitalism intact by intensifying its logic. And Marx is very clear about the fact that we need to maintain uh, science, progress, all of these elements, materialism, all of these elements of Western enlightenment into communism. And so for Baudrillard, it seems that communism is only ever going to mirror capitalism. It's only ever going to mirror the logic of production that predominates capitalist exploitation. Now, and this is a, another side, a side point, but this really reveals how uh, reactionaries and conservatives in so many political settings are really clever when they illustrate communism as the boogeyman to uh, their way of life. Because according to Baudrillard, it really isn't. In fact, there's a lot in common between both capitalism and communism in maintaining what these people really uh, pride themselves on, be it their own heteropatriarchal monogamous way of life, their own uh, appreciation of science, rationality, and so on, if we can say that conservatives are really embracing these values. But it's, I think that it's a good point in that we have to look at the ways in which the apparent opposition to capitalism, because it attains its value within a dialectical framework, is going to maintain many of those same elements. 
And this is why later on in Baudrillard's career, he's going to try to think of a way to expand the categories or explode the categories of the dialectic to uh, open up newness to some extent, to uh, get away from those limitations. And that's more or less it. I know I was harsh on Marx, and I feel like I should be very clear. Marx has a lot to offer, and I'm a very big fan as to for what he offers and what the people after him would say. So this is really just about what how I interpret Baudrillard to be criticizing Marx, and I'd love to hear if anyone has any more from what they think Baudrillard is trying to say in criticizing Marx, or in ways where Baudrillard was just totally wrong. I'd really love to hear about it. And yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Take care.